We're turning now to topic number 16, the Shia or Shiite Muslim. <clears throat> when um, Muhammad's wife Khadija died, he was uh, very discouraged, depressed about that. And, um, and then shortly he did marry uh, another wife and other wives. He had a number of wives. As long as Khadija lived, he only had her. He had no other wives. And um, um, one of the wives he was especially, uh, his, one of his favorites, he treated them all equally, of course, as prophet he was supposed to do that. But Aisha was, was very special. And um, she actually came into his home when she was a little girl. Not that the marriage was consummated at that time, but, um, but uh, this, this Aisha, this young, young girl, comes into this home. And um, uh, he has a daughter called Fatima. And I've, no Muslim has ever shared this with me, so I may be completely off the mark here. But um, as I see it, um, the, these two girls, Aisha and Fatima, they're in the home of Muhammad, uh, had, had a struggle. They struggled with each other. And after Muhammad died, uh, this struggle became, uh, became uh, present within the whole community. And it was a struggle over leadership. And um, Fatima and her husband Ali believed with, there was a whole group following them in this conviction, that the, that the, that the descendant of the prophet Muhammad should be the leader of the community. And of course, since Fatima was the oldest child, he had no sons, Muhammad had no sons who lived. Since she was the oldest child, why uh, Ali, her husband, should become the leader of the community. And, um, and then you had the, the, the wider, larger group in the community who disagreed with that and uh, believed that, um, that it should be the community who decides who the leader will be. And Aisha was part of that group. In fact, a very vigorous defender of that understanding. And, um, and of course, Fatima and her husband were with the other group. And so this deep divide developed um, in regards to leadership within, within the early Muslim community. And so the Sunni group believed that the leader should be chosen by, by the, uh, by the uh, community as a whole. And um, so the first, the first um, um, and, and so, and, and, and Ali and, and Fatima believed that, that it should be, that, that, that he, should be, he should be the leader. So the first three leaders, um, Abu Bakr and Omar and Uthman, those first three, one after the other, were within the Sunni movement. They were not related to the Prophet. They were not his descendants. And they were the leaders. They were called the Caliphs, you know. After Uthman was assassinated, then uh, there was a struggle, and Ali now became the leader, Fatima's husband. And so now the Shiites have won the struggle, but the struggle continued. And in fact, it finally led to civil war between the, uh, the partisans of Ali, who were referred to as Shiites, and the wider Sunni community. And as I said, uh, Aisha was with the wider Sunni movement, and Fatima is... Uh, and her husband Ali are giving leadership to the, to the uh, Shiite, to the Shiite movement. Um, this, uh, this struggle um, eventually led to uh, the, uh, Ali was killed in the war, in the civil wars going on and so forth. And then his son Hussein, the grandson of the prophet, became the, became the imam. The Shiites called the leaders of their movement the imams and the, and the Sunnis caliphs. So, Imam Hussein, the grandson of the prophet, became the, uh, the leader after Ali was killed in, uh, in, these, in these wars. And then he was martyred. Hussein was martyred um, in, um, in Karbala, in present-day Iraq. And you know these annual pilgrimages that they take to, the, to, the, uh, to Karbala, taking place now since the Saddam Hussein regime is no more. Uh, it's, it's all about that, going there to Karbala where he was assassinated, where he was martyred. And so this, this whole struggle uh, brought this great divide within the Muslim movement, 
with one wing, about 90% of the Muslims being Sunni. Uh, the head of the community is the Caliph. Um, and then the other wing being the Shia movement, and the head of the community is called the Imam. And the Imams within the Shia movement are always descendants of the Prophet. Um, and um, and he, 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 he takes on to himself the um, Quranic authority. He is, he is a, they see him as an incarnation of Quranic authority. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, the Pope in Catholic theology who has the keys of the kingdom. And uh, this Imam has Quranic authority. And um, he is infallible. He makes no mistakes. The infallible leader, you see. Um, and there's a group, there, there's a variety of Shia movements because of disputes and so forth about which, which of the sons of the previous Imam should actually become the new Imam. So you have groups like the Ismailis and so forth and so forth. The largest group are, are called the Ithnashari, or the Twelvers, and they would be the Iranian Shia movement. Iran is almost 100% Shia, not 100%, but, but largely, largely, largely Shia, and they're called the Twelvers, the Ithnashari. The reason the Iranians are referred to as the Twelvers or the Ithnashari is because after the twelfth Imam, um, uh, the Imam, I mentioned this the other day, the Imam vanished. And so they say, that, that, um, all, that he vanished because people were not obeying him. This ha happened 800, 800 years ago. And so for 800 years, the Iranian Shia have not had an imam. Uh, but they say his spirit, his occultation, prevails. And like I said yesterday, the work of the Ayatollahs is to tune into this occultation and to put together a political religious system which is in harmony with his thinking. And they believe... Um, they're very eschatological. They believe that as they follow the occultation, the, 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 the inner wisdom of the imam, both imam, his spirit, that uh, then he'll come back again with Jesus. And that's what the whole Iranian revolution is about. This straining forward with great expectation for the coming of the Mahdi, who vanished 800 years ago, and they think they just about have it together, you see. Uh, the political religious system, which is in harmony with his thinking, and so he is delighted with what they're doing, and he will most certainly return with Jesus to bring about the establishment and the spread of Islam throughout the world, probably, and certainly peace and justice throughout the world. That will be their mission. And so a lot of discussion about what all that means, but that is the ethos and the uh, spiritual um, in, uh, tug of Iranian um, um, Shiite Islam. But then you have the Sunni wing, which is the larger wing, and as I said, they are led by the caliph, and, um, and, um, uh, and he, the caliph is chosen by the ulama, by the wise men of the, of the, of the uh, movement. And uh, so for them, there's no imam with, uh, with um, infallible authority who leads their movement. The caliph is not infallible, he is the leader of the movement. And he combines spiritual and political power, the caliph, that's his responsibility. However, among the Sunni, uh, when Ataturk, when Ataturk uh, became the, um, the, the general in, Ethi in, in, in Turkey, um, uh, instituted his secular revolution in Turkey, why um, he dismissed the caliph. <coughs> and so from the time of the Turkish secular revolution to the present day, there is no caliph at the head of the Sunni Muslim movement. They have none, you know. So for the last, uh, what, some 90 years, there's been no, no um, 80 years, there's been no, no leader um, within the Sunni movement. Um, the, the, the caliph resided in Istanbul as, as we move into the, into the um, uh, 20th century. That, that was the seat of the Ottoman power, the Ottoman Empire, and that's where the caliph resided, because the Ottomans were, were the, had suzerainty over, over the Sunnis worldwide, and, and, and he was dismissed. So for that time to today, there is no authority that speaks for the worldwide Sunni movement, um, which of course is one of the crises within, uh, within global, global Islam. Who speaks for the Muslims? <laughs> where is that authority to be found?
Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed over 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at www.tvseminary.com. So it's important to have some awareness of this division and the difference uh, within, uh, within these, these two movements. Let me pause for questions and then we'll bring this to closure. Yes. Uh, which group are the more Muslims? The, the, are the more? The, among the whole Muslim people, I mean, the Islam. Which group is bigger by percentage? Oh, okay, well, the Sunni, the Sunni would comprise, I think, about 90%. So recently I was reading a figure written, uh, an essay written by a Shia who said that the Sunnis comprise 80%. I guess it's not sure. But between 80 and 90% would be Sunni, and between 10 and 20% would be Shia. And remember, Iran is the largest Shia community, and uh, Iran is essentially you do have significant Christian minorities in Iran, Armenian Christians particularly, um, and some Zoroastrians, but the country is basically Shia. And the whole Iranian revolution is a Shia revolution. So when, when they make a mission, when they try to convert someone to the Muslim, how they divide among the new territories or how they, like right now in Russia, many former Soviet Union republics, and I heard this name mixed up, the, the Khalifat or Imams or something, do they still fight you in the new territories or how they divided the mission field or something? And yeah, well, often, oftentimes the Shia and the Sunni work together quite peacefully, but also oftentimes there's tension. Witness what is going on in Iraq today. Um, and uh, it's a legacy of Saddam Hussein to be sure, but uh, the tensions are very, very real. Um, and so um, I don't think one can make any universal claim. Um, some places uh, in the United States, for example, the Shia and the Sunni worship together in the same mosque. And some places in the world that would be unthinkable. The, the, the problem, of course, is that from a Sunni perspective, the way the which, in which the Shia have elevated the Imam to be infallible and the incarnation of Quranic authority feels to them to be heretical. It feels almost as if they're giving an associate to God. Whereas for the, for the Shia perspective, um, in our modern world and throughout history, it is necessary to have a, um, a leader who has the authority to interpret Islam contextually within the world in which we live. So the Shia have a much more kind of incarnational kind of, kind of uh, view of authority than do the Sunni. And so theologically, there's, there's significant divergences. When I was in Iran at that Mahdi conference, I heard 20 sermons, 21 sermons, I guess it was, on, on this whole Mahdism. And uh, I was impressed with how very high the Shia elevate the leader of the community and the Mahdi. Um, it, um, it, uh, it, uh, it, uh, yeah, I tried to imagine Sunni Muslims sitting there and hearing that, how they would feel. And I could, I could get a sense of the tensions, the theological tensions, as I sat and as I was bathed in this Mahdi theology for, for two days, hearing sermon after sermon about it. But then, you know, there's a kind of space and, and dialogical space with, with the Shia, which is Sunnis likewise oftentimes, but I think especially the Shia, which is quite remarkable. I uh, was amazed that they invited five Christians to come to that meeting, and three of us invited to make presentations, myself included. Um, I was trying to imagine a conference of Mennonites somewhere in the world on, uh, on, uh, on the incarnation of Christ and inviting um, uh, a, a, a Muslim to make a, give a sermon on, on the Islamic take on the incarnation. I don't think we would have done it. But here they invited me to speak <laughs> on Jesus. And uh, I shared with him what I shared with you yesterday, his journey to the cross, which is not an Islamic take at all on what Jesus is about. But uh, it's a desire to, to hear the spiritual streams without, throughout the world, which led them to do that. And I just admire them immensely. I think it's just wonderful. Yes? The caliph that were dismissed in Turkey, and is there any attempt now to restore the caliph among the Muslims? 
Yeah, I, I, I think that the world Muslim movement feels it would be hopeless to come to the kind of consensus necessary to restore the caliph. You know, that's a good question. I don't know what happened to him when he was dismissed. I think he just went into exile, you know. Uh, he wasn't killed or anything like that, but uh, he was dismissed. So there's been no, no caliph. Now, of course, they have the Muslim World Congress, which, uh, which I guess would be the closest thing to a central authority, but there's no particular person who is noted as being the Muslim, the leader of the Muslim world, uh, like you had when you had the caliphs back then. Um, Al-Azhar University um, with, um, is probably the intellectual center of the Muslim world. Um, but again, uh, many Muslims will critique Al-Azhar and some of their um, innovative theologies and so forth. And so, um, uh, you know, there, there would be a mixed bag al are intellectually probably, as much as anything, represent the center of the Muslim world. And al are, by the way, does invite Christians sometimes to address them. A friend of mine uh, was invited recently to, um, to speak at al Azhar University, packed out, absolutely packed out, which place just packed out, on uh, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And he is, um, he is consummate understanding of Arabic and the Hadith, and he exegeted the Hadith to make a case that Christ was crucified. And... Um, Afterwards, the rector said, you know, this is, a, this is something we need to hear. He had innovation after he was finished. Um, and um, the rector said, we, we need to hear more about this. Uh, so uh, within Al-Azhar itself, there's often more space than you might think for theological discourse and dialogue taking place. Yes? Uh, maybe I missed that. Uh while there is no Khalif for Sunnis, uh, who is the Imam for Shiites? It's Iranian president, or who, who is the Imam right now? Well, see, since the 12th Imam, they have had no Imam in, also, the, in, in, in the Ethnic Shari movement, the Twelvers movement. For 800 years, no Imam. Instead of, but they're waiting for him to come back. They say he vanished because people were not obeying him. When, when the society finally is obeying him, then he will return. So like I said yesterday, instead of the Imam, you have the Ayatollahs. And you have this council of Ayatollahs who discern who should be their leader. And he is called the great leader, the great leader. And the great leader recently uh, said, in this conflict about the elections and everything, he said, <laughs> I speak with the authority of God. That's good Shia theology, you know, to critique us. And my authority is to critique um, God's authority. We represent the authority of God. What he said, as I understand it, um, as I read it in the press, um, I hope that I'm not misquoting him, but uh, it, would be, it would be authentic is, is Shia theology, a comment like that. For in Shia theology, the Imam is the incarnation of Quranic authority and he is infallible. So be careful about critiquing him. <laughs> it's not a very wise thing to do to critique an, uh, an authority like that. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for 
tvs.gift at gmail.com.